What's going on, y'all? This is Josh and Mike from Team Super Shoe. We are back with episode number three of The Shoe Show. We are not talking about cowboy boots or Crocs. We are talking about our guy, Corey LaJoy from NASCAR. Mike, what's going on, man? Man, I'm doing great. Uh, just super pumped up to be here, man. Uh, episode three, it's going to be a stacked show for you guys. Uh, got to talk about the headliner, Corey LaJoy. We got him. He's in the house. Uh, Awesome interview there. Uh, Mr. Andrew Miller, uh, Team Super Shoes member of the month, will be here. Uh, Mr. Josh Medor is going to provide some interesting insight to the Daytona 500 for us. All right, y'all. So we told you we're bringing on our buddy Josh Medor. He is the shoe analyst. We brought him on because uh, he's been a part of Team Super Shoe on Facebook for some time now, and he's a uh, made some cool posts about he has all these stats and he, he knows a lot about where Corey might finish because of his averages and how he does. Uh, so we wanted to kind of bring him on and see what he thinks about Daytona. So uh, Josh, how you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Love what you guys are doing. Uh, I've been a fan of Corey's for uh, probably about three or four years now. Um, I didn't really have a driver after Dale Jr. retired. So uh, I uh, was kind of looking for somebody and even further back than that, I'm from New England uh, and grew up kind of watching big Randy LaJoy uh, driving in the Bush series. So when I found out that Corey had, you know, Randy had a son who was driving, I was like, this guy seems legit. He's the real deal. Super nice guy. Great, great character, great individual. And so I really gravitated towards him. Uh, and uh, since I've been on the Facebook group, I like to share my, uh, analysis i guess with stats uh, via racingreference.com uh it's a great website to uh to kind of peruse stats and kind of sort by different tracks and whatnot uh that's not a paid advertisement <laughs> i uh i just like numbers uh i deal with numbers a lot in my job uh and i also kind of just gravitate towards statistics so happy to share some uh, some analysis and some some stats coming at you for daytona Awesome. So what do you think? How's uh, how's Corey going to stack up um, in a couple of weeks of Daytona? Yeah, so it's probably no surprise to your listeners and your and your viewers that Daytona is is his best track uh, statistics wise. Uh, his, it's his best track uh, with like more than eight races. And so he has a better average actually at a couple of tracks that he's only raced that once or twice. But his overall average in 10 races at Daytona is 18.4 his, his finishing average. <clears throat> so if you break that down a little bit, what I did was removed the crashes. So the, the races that he didn't finish for whatever reason, because we know Daytona is, is huge for the big crashes for the wrecks about half the field usually finishes the race. Uh, if you, if you take out the crashes, his, his average is even better. It's 14.3. And so when he's running at the finish, you can expect him to have a top 50 at least. And so looking even further into those numbers, which you can really do a lot with this, his last five races at Daytona, he has an average finish of 12th. Uh, so when I look at something, I always look at if they're improving, if they're getting better. And so if you look at his first five races in his career at Daytona, it was 24.8, his average finish. So versus the last five races, an average finish of 12th. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And so uh, barring any crashes, and I know that's what probably every driver says, uh, you can expect him to have a top 15 or top 10 just by the numbers. So uh, we all know that drafting restrictor plates are not really restrictor plates, whatever they're called these days, tapered spacers. Yeah. Um, so let's just say super speedway racing can be super unpredictable, but we know that Corey can draft up there. He's got a, you know, a more even playing field with the next gen car. So I'm going to tell you right now, top 10, if he's running at the finish, top 10 is almost a lock in my mind. I agree. I agree. Um, I'm uh, hoping that he, you know, I know he's going to be a little conservative that, you know, Daytona 500 spent, pays a lot of money just to even finish in the Absolutely. top 10. He can finish 10th and they're, they're banking and being a smaller team. It's uh, yeah. something they can benefit on for sure. But hoping, uh, hoping we get a little bit of zest there in the last 10 laps and give us something exciting. Hopefully the 77, we can work together or um, whomever. Um where do you where do you see him finishing, Mike? Um, day twenty five hundred this year. Um, ahead of Anthony Alfredo. Um, so <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, I think I have to agree with Mister Medor here. Um, I think a top fifteen is is in the books for sure. Um, really, I'm going to be disappointed 
um, if it's only a 15th place finish. I'm, I just somehow truly believe in my heart um, that this team is capable of something truly special to start off 2022 in the Daytona 500. And, you know, every bit of me wants to say that that team is going to go out and win. And I don't know that they will, but I, I think possibly Corey LaJoy has his best career finish in the Daytona 500. Um, if he gets his first career win, um, it's going to be time to party. And um, if we're a little late on producing the next episode, it's because we're in the middle of a one week hangover. So it's uh, like, it's going to be super exciting for sure. I like where your head's at. I think I think it's not too much of a stretch to say he'll probably he has a good chance as ever, probably his best chance at finishing in the top five. Uh, so, you know, if you look at his career. He has 10. I'm sorry. He has four career top tens uh, and three of them have come at Daytona. So right there. Shows you he's got a 75%, I guess, average on finishing in the top 10 for all his, you know, top 10 careers. Uh, actually, I, I don't know. That's probably another thing that I should have researched is where his other top 10 came at. You guys know off the top of your head? Um, I don't, I don't want to speak on it, but it would seem like it'd probably be a restrictor plate track, I would guess. It was probably, I mean, yeah, it was probably Talladega. Good call. Yeah. Where did he finish at? at Martinsville in the 32 car a couple of years ago. Remember when they left him out late on yep. pit strategy? Like, I mean, it wasn't the right call, obviously, but where did he finish at in that? I think, Do you think was it was like, I think it was like a 19th or 18th or something like that. It was impressive for the 32 team for sure. Uh, and, and, and speaking of 32, just a quick story on that. One of the reasons I, I kind of started watching Corey is because 32 is kind of my number. Uh, I grew up watching Ricky Craven in the tide ride. If you remember that machine, uh, the 32 tide car. Uh, and I had 32 for little league teams, always on my jersey. 32 was my number for a while. So when when I saw that there was a 32 car and it was Corey LaJoy, I was, you know, I was like, this is natural. This is it. So uh, and now seven, I have a connection to because I have seven kids. That's another fun fact about me is I have seven children. So uh, it's all it's all good. It all makes sense. But uh, but yeah, really looking forward to Daytona. And, you know, the one thing obviously our, our listeners and, and viewers need to understand is, it's so unpredictable. Daytona is you could finish first, you could finish last with a good with a good car. If you get caught up in the red in the big one, uh, Josh, I know you you have a, a topic about that coming up soon. But uh, but yeah, it's it's so unpredictable. So take these stats with a grain of salt. But Mike, you're right. His chances of finishing in the top five, top ten, he's got the best opportunity, the best ride of his career. The next gen car levels the playing field. If he can mix it up there and dice it up there with drafting, I think he's going to be in really good shape. Well, like you were saying, uh, yes, I do have that coming up. Uh, do you think uh, the big one is going to be – or let me reword that. Uh, who do you think is going to be the fault of the big one? Uh, people that come to my mind is uh, Stenhouse, Logano, or even Elliot. So what do you guys got on that? Mike, I'll let you go first. Um, so I hate to keep picking on this guy, but I don't think I'm the only one that shares this opinion. I mean, it's, it's Ricky Stenhouse. I feel like this guy, and I, and I can't knock him for being too aggressive at the end of the day. I'm not a race car driver. I'll never have the privilege of, of knowing what that pressure is like, you know, with one or two laps left and the big race, you know what I mean? Making all these dicey moves, but it seems like for whatever reason, um, this guy doesn't exercise nearly as much caution with his with his blocks and you know aggressive moves and and we've seen it happen time and time again on the, on these super speedway package tracks uh, where typically um, that's the root or you know or the cause of the big one. But at the end of the day, I think the I don't I, I think it's too hard to really predict uh, you know for sure you know who causes it. At, at the end of the day. It's going to be somewhere in that top five or top 10 guys, somebody that are trying to, to make it all happen with the pay window opens. And sometimes it works out and sometimes you bring back your steering wheel. So we'll see what happens. Well, speaking of bringing back your steering wheel, someone famous for grabbing the steering wheel out of the car after a win and, and holding it above his head. I, I always picture Logano as a, a feast or famine type of driver. He's either either winning or finishing up front or wrecking in the back. Uh, because he throws the most aggressive blocks. We all know that. Uh, that's kind of his trademark. I think with the next-gen car, I, I've heard and read things that it's super sensitive. Uh, the, the, the steering is super sensitive. They've got a new rear-view camera, digital camera, that shows their, 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 the back of their car. So I expect 
uh, Joey to be throwing even the more aggressive blocks with the new vehicle. So maybe he's going to be a little bit more timid or conservative at first. But if I had to guess, I think it's somebody like a Penske car, like if it's not Logano, maybe maybe a Blaney or something. But uh, but my money's on Logano for either winning or finishing uh, starting starting the big one. Now, talking about Logano, do you think that there is going to be any animosity between him and uh, Brad now that Brad Kozlowski is in a new team? He's no longer a partner. Uh, he might not have to hold back so much. You know, they don't have to be so much of a teammates. Do you think that uh, we maybe not at Daytona, but do you think that we uh, we see any type of uh, rough racing between the two? I, I think um, we'll it's super speedway racing. I mean, it's just that's how it happens. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't think there's really anything you can do to control that. You know what I mean, Chu? Bail the asphalt, <laughs> <laughs> darling. Well, I, I, I think you know we kind of saw a little bit of it last year with with Joey and Brad. Kind of not, not so much tension, but there was a little bit of animosity. I feel like that they didn't really admit to. And Brad is is the type of guy I think that he just overanalyzes everything and he thinks about everything. So I can guarantee you when he sees Joey in his rear view or if he's around him on the track, he's probably thinking, how's this guy going to race me? How should I race him? Uh, and I don't think there's really any uh, reason why we can't see some sort of not a rivalry, but there might be a little bit of bad blood between them as, as opponents now versus teammates. So uh, and Brad's the type of guy who will internalize a lot of things, I feel like, and then maybe just like explode or, you know, like lash out, I guess, once in a while about it. But he has mellowed, too. So as a team owner, I can see the other side of things that he doesn't want to wreck his equipment and lean to slay or, or get in any scraps or scuffles that he, he may regret. So I think it could go either way, but I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe a little bit of chippiness between those two. Yeah, I'm sure both of them blame, you know, the other, the other party that uh, they didn't win the Daytona 500 last year. Not that that it wasn't a great thing for who won, but uh, you know, yep. if it wasn't for that, you know, crazy wreck and turn three, and turn four, you know, yep. absolutely. So, and speaking of the craziness of Daytona, uh, who do you guys think would it's, it's last lap of the Daytona 500 Corey's slowly making his way up, playing the conservative role. And he's got to get from 10th to first, maybe lap, last lap, maybe the last two laps. Who do you see tanning him with him and pushing him to the victory? Go ahead, Josh. Well, that's an interesting question because, you know, you, you look at uh, the stable of Chevy drivers. It's probably not as robust as it, as it has been in the past. Um, I think of, you know, maybe not manufacturer based, but people, you know, drivers that Corey has come up with. You look at Bubba Wallace, you look at, you look at maybe some of the other guys, like, uh, I don't know if Ryan Priest is in this race, but I know he's raced around him. Kyle Larson, he kind of has history with, with K and N. So, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe the Hendrick cars is probably might be the easy answer for this, but, uh, I think Corey is so well liked in the garage, probably except for Denny Hamlin. I know we all remember the Denny Hamlin spat. I think they're cool him. now. <laughs> yeah, I think they are. I think they are. But, uh, you know, I, I guess the easy answer would be the Hendrick cars. Uh, uh, they're usually pretty good on super speedways. I know they haven't won lately, but uh, if Alex Bowman or William Byron or Kyle Larson are up there, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Corey was able to latch on to some of them. Another thing, too, is maybe some of the former backmarkers who have better rides now. Uh, you know, I, off the top of my head, I, I can't think of, of, of a particular driver, but uh, maybe some of those, you know, drivers that were in the 30s or 40s or, you know, in the 30s mid pack uh, who he raced around for a long time, like a Ross Chastain. Uh, I, I see him, you know, probably helping Corey and him, Corey helping him. So I would say the Chevy drivers is a pretty good answer. But uh, I think we all know Corey is so well liked in the garage that uh, it wouldn't be hard to envision him drafting with almost anybody. Well, Corey has definitely uh, come across on uh, several podcast interviews saying how important uh, team orders are and uh, that it's almost like a guarantee that the, you know, Fords have to push the Fords and the Chevys have to pick the Chevy. So in my opinion, uh, who I see pushing him up to the front, obviously, if it's not the 77, that would obviously be too easy of a pick. Uh, so besides him, I would say uh, Austin Dillon. I would say that Austin Dillon and him have a good relationship. Uh, they also have the connection with uh, Ryan Sparks. Ryan Sparks used to be 
uh, the head, uh, or, you know, used to be the head of three car and used to do things in RCR. Um, he has a good relationship and they still, they still hang out and talk. So I could see that happening. Um, just so as long as Corey stays away from Tyler Reddick, because I gotta be honest, he was trying to wreck our boy in August. And, um, I don't know if, I mean, I'm not a race car driver. I don't know if it was Tyler or if it was Corey, if Corey wasn't driving the line, right. And he was getting himself. I don't know. Uh, I, but the way that they were connecting was not the right way. Yeah. So Mike, you got anything, you got anybody, any predictions of who's pushing Corey to the front? No, not right offhand, man. I just, I'll I'll say just like Josh did though. I mean, it's going to be with somebody from the Chevy stable, right? We're going to have to hook up with another Camaro and try to go to the front. Um, My only concern, man, is I look back to that August race last year. And if you go and listen to a lot of the scanner audio and whatnot, a lot of the bigger name drivers or the more consistent front runners, they were not super comfortable with having Corey LaJoy at the front. And it just simply comes because Corey doesn't have a ton of experience in those, you know, pressure situations. Right. So I kind of wonder if it's going to be hard for Corey to find a friend at the end, but I think that's where it'll be that much more crucial that he tries to, to forge those relationships in the first 195 laps of the race. That way when five or six to go comes around, maybe they can make a push to the front. And I don't say that to, to discourage anybody or be like, man, well, this guy's not even pulling for Corey LeJoy. Like, what's going on with this guy? You know, I just want to keep it honest and, you know, realistic for sure. Um, I think that's potentially something that Corey could face if he's in the front at the end. But at that point, I just hope he's a hell of a blocker, and I hope he can find a way to make that car three and four cars wide at one time and bring it home for sure. I'm not – I don't know what race it was, but it was one of the super speedways last year where Corey was in, in the front. He led a few laps. I think it may have been Talladega in the fall. Um, so that may have helped him a little bit because because that that day the seven car was real strong. So uh, I think he ha- I think he has made progress in getting other people to trust him at, at the front. But you're right, Mike. It's it, he's not like a usual suspect that's always out the front. So it's going to take a little bit of time, and hopefully he builds some relationships uh, and some deals maybe before the race to hook up with, with with another driver at the end. But it's just so exciting these super speedway races. I just have to say like. We all, we all know that towards the end, Corey's going to be there. If he didn't crash out, he will be there at the end. Uh, and so it's really just awesome to see what lane he picks, uh, how he manages the restarts. So uh, I'm calling it right now, five, five, four laps to go. If there's a restart, Corey will be in the mix. So we'll see what happens. For sure. Hopefully Corey is not stacking pennies after Daytona. He is stacking them Benjamins. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Josh Medora, thank you so much for hanging out with us, man. Absolutely. And um, we appreciate your uh, analysis and uh, just looking forward to a good race at Daytona. Same here. I'm happy to be on. Uh, I'll be providing my uh, statistics for before every race, most every race as I can uh, with my busy life, but uh, on the Facebook group. So really happy to be a part of this. And it's really awesome what you guys are doing. And And best of luck with all the future episodes. Thank you, man. All right. Take it easy. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yes, sir. Corey LaJoy from Charlotte, North Carolina. Born on September 25th, 1991 to proud parents, Lisa and Randy LaJoy. You might could say that Corey was destined to become a race car driver. By the time Corey was old enough to drive anything, his father was an already established name in the then NASCAR Bush Series, a two-time champion of the division, and a very well-respected name in the Saturday Series garage. And who could forget Don LaJoy, the local dirt track ace who made a name for himself long before there was ever social media to tell the stories. You could say that racing was in Corey's blood. From a young age, Corey could be found racing go-karts behind his father's shop. The story goes that it was around this time that people at the shop took notice of this kid's ability to go fast in a race car. Many were quoted as saying that that boy has a shoe, and they quickly referred to him as Super Shoe. And as you'll find out later in our story, that name has stuck. In 1996, LaJoy began his racing career at the senior citizen-like age of five years old. Racing on the local karting scene, he stacked 19 trophies to his credit. 
In 2003, he would move to the next level in his racing journey, the INEX Bandolero Series. And of the races ran that year on the circuit, LaJoy amassed 12 wins on his way to picking up the big hardware in the Summer Shootout Championship. In 2005, it was yet time again to move to the next challenge, the Legends Series. And one year later, in 2006, it would see Corey LaJoy in the Pro Challenge Series, knocking down an astonishing 10 wins out of just a 12-race schedule. It was becoming clear to many that Super Shoe was a professional loud pedal pusher, and a damn good one at that. We're here with the United States Services 70 winner, Corey LaJoy. Corey, talk about uh, returning to Victor Lane and doing it at New Hampshire Motor Speedway. Uh, man, man, it feels great. Uh, had a lot of family here, aunts, uncles, cousins all here cheering me on. And, uh, to, to cross out the finish line, getting that checkered flag, man, was great. And, uh, I can't th thank uh, uh, Rainier Racing with MBM enough, uh, Jen and Auto Parts, CarQuest for putting me this opportunity to uh, to get this monkey off my back up as of here lately, man. It, uh, it feels like it could never get off. So it's good to shake it. It's good to get back in victory lane and uh, good to get the confidence back up. Flash forward through a couple of years of doing much the same, working through the next echelons of racing platforms. In 2009, LaJoy would find himself in the K&N E-Series, and he would run here through 2012, picking up his first win at Bowman Gray Stadium. This three-year span would see Corey win five different times. In 2013, Shu would make his Xfinity Series debut at Homestead Miami Speedway. Albeit not the result they wanted, he had made it to a premier touring series of NASCAR. Moving forward now to about 2017, he began racing in the Cup Series for BK Racing. While it was not the most competitive car, it was a chance for Corey to learn these bigger, much more powerful beasts. In 2018, he would run a limited schedule and he would split his ride with another driver while at TriStar Racing. Of the three races he ran for that team, two resulted in unfortunate engine failures. Not the best thing to happen when you're trying to show what you're truly capable of as a race car driver. 2019, however, would seem to offer a little hope. A ride with a small team named Go Fast Racing would see him run full-time in the Cup Series. He would acquire two top 10 finishes in 2019, both on restrictor plate tracks Daytona and Talladega. 2020 would once again find LaJoy with Go Fast, but it was not a year for the record books. After many mechanical failures and many, many more disappointing results, he announced that he and the team would part ways at the conclusion of that year. And shortly thereafter, Corey would make headlines once again when he announced that he and current crew chief Ryan Sparks would depart Go Fast Racing and relocate to Spire Motorsports to build a team nearly off the ground. First time I had the idea of recreating the Alan Quickie shot was as soon as I knew that they bought the shop. Corey LaJoy was just 19 months old when Alan Kowicki was killed in a plane crash, but he grew up understanding the legacy that Kowicki left. My grandpa always told me that I, I needed to be more like Alan Kowicki, and that's how I pretty much started just working on my own cars and knowing bump steer and, and just little things like that that separated a guy like Alan from the rest of his competitors. And uh, it's really cool to, to bring back the seven, to be able to work in his old shop that him and uh, Paul Andrew worked out of and had a lot of success out of. And 30 years after this shot, let's do one more. With the seven car back in the picture, Corey LaJoy in the same spot in front of what is now Spire Motorsports. Yes, perfect. We did it. I think that we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't uh, recreate this seven out front of Alan Quickie, now Spire Motorsports shop to, uh, to relive some nostalgia. Crew Chief Ryan Sparks is joining LaJoy at Spire after working together in 2020. He knows competing with the big teams is tough, but also that's what Cole Wickie did for the championship in this very space in 1992. The way it all worked out is pretty cool, you know, uh, to also just be bringing back the number seven and uh, coming out of this building. So hopefully we can make him proud and, uh, you know, and, and inspire motorsports as well. But it's, it's you know, pretty exciting story and uh, gives us a little extra drive. It's going to be tough to compete with the, with the bigger teams. Um, 
but there's no reason I don't see why we can't ease our way up into the top 15. 2021 seen a lot of confidence builders for that team, mounting finishes well beyond the expectations of their fellow competitors. Who could forget those runs at the night race in Daytona and the week after while dancing with the lady in black? How about five consecutive race finishes inside the top 20? With the lack of funding, qualifying, practice, and the ability to have setup notes, this team united under pressure, and they found a way to get the job done every week. Compared to 2019 and 2020, this past year has seen relatively low counts for mechanical failures. And Corey also does a remarkable job at conserving and maintaining his equipment. And with that, there were far fewer bent fenders this year as well. 2022. Schluter Systems and Built Bar will return as familiar sponsors adorning the number 7 automobile. Some new slick paint schemes are to debut soon, and that'll help you better find Corey amongst the field as he's out there stacking pennies. But... What if this year it's not so much about stacking pennies, but rather about cashing in and collecting? Could Corey get that elusive first career victory this year? The team certainly thinks that they have a shot at several tracks this season. Some people might say that they're gambling, but Team Super Shoe is going to gamble with them. In fact, we're going all in on the number seven for 2022. Now, without further ado, help us welcome Corey LaJoy. The shoe himself has arrived. That's the kind of guy that you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get a program and start building around it. This is the driver that you want, Corey LaJoy. He's a he's a self-made, knows how to work on cars, knows what the, knows how to put them together, knows how to fix them. He's wrecked plenty of them and had to fix his own stuff, so he knows what they're worth. He knows how to take care of them. He's got an amazing pace. All right, team, Team Super Shoe, we have got the man, the one and only, Corey Super Shoe LaJoy. He is here and in the house. Corey, how you doing? Thank you so much for joining us, brother. Man, well, I feel, feel honored that y'all uh, asked me to be on the shoe show. I mean, I've been hearing about it, been seeing, you know, Tweets all over about how people love this shoe show, talking about some flapjack that rides around in circles on Sunday. So um, appreciate just y'all doing the – just in the trenches, preaching the Court of the Joy name. Uh, appreciate that for, you know, the last couple of years. It hasn't, it hasn't been easy, but we're going to go hopefully, um, like I said in that tweet on New Year's, hopefully we've been paying dues and stacking long enough time to collect some – we collect some pennies, lots of them this year. So how y'all doing? Good, man. Good, man. Thank you for uh, joining us and taking the time away from your beautiful family and from your work. Um, so, Corey, we had uh, a question. Um, the uh, We just witnessed the Daytona testing of the, the next-gen cars. And um, my opinion of it, that was the first time me seeing the next-gens, um, I felt like they were a little bit quieter um are they quieter or is that just like was that the place that i was standing at i don't know what the decibels are to be honest I, now if they should be quieter for the fans they should be louder for the guys in the infield because we haven't had pipes out the left side in like 15 years uh so now the left side of the block goes out the left side of the car, right side of the block goes out the right. Uh, so it should, it should make it quieter for the fans, louder for the pit crews. So a um, little bit give and take. I got gotcha. you. Well, regardless, um, the most important thing to me as a race fan is that um, I've always appreciated the smells of a NASCAR race. Um, the uh, I don't know if it's the, the fuel and the, the burnt rubber, but there's something about going to a NASCAR race that um, that's always been something that's bring back memories to me back when, you know, I was 10 years old. Yeah, for sure. I, I, uh, I remember like when I first got bit by the bug, I was probably seven, six, because it had been 96 or seven when dad was in his heyday in driving that 74 FINA car. And we were at Darlington 
and I know I literally know the exact spot where I was standing and I can go, I walk back there every time I go to Darlington uh, to kind of relive it. It was after the race and the smells to your point and like the, just the cars that were all sandblasted and had the doors beat off of them. And it was like the rubber, the gear oil, the burnt oil from the motors, uh, like the, the entire thing, like, Oh, like this shit's pretty cool. Um, and that's kind of when I, when I got really intrigued to really start like pursuing it, you know, I was messing around racing go-karts in the, in the backyard. But, um, you know, after that, I, I really put, started putting some effort towards it and, um, yeah, but that, that alone, uh, you know, once you go and you feel it and you kind of taste it and you see it, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to get that bug out of you for sure. I got you, man. And, um, ultimately I just wanted to thank you for spending the time with all of us, uh, I guess, zombies at the other side of that, uh, glass in the, uh, the pits. Um, it's gotta be kind of weird to see all those people asking for your autographs and taking selfies and stuff, but, um, that's one of the reasons why we're a big fan is that you um, take the time to spend with us and uh, make us feel important. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for uh, for just giving us the time, you know, walking away from your table from Ryan Sparks and, uh, you know, chatting with us for a little bit. Oh, man, like that's what people think is is like such a. Like a separating like a separating thing. Now, we are like in that particular context, we were separated by glass. Like I felt like I was a hamster in like the looking glass of a kind of an aquarium or something, people just watching your work. But, you know, we're literally like no different, no more or less special. Let's literally just like the job that we chose to do and we all chose to do. It just happens, happens to be on TV. So that's what I tell people all the time. It's like, yeah, I get to, you know, a lot of people follow you on social media and a lot of people think it's this or that, but do I just live like a normal life and I just get to do damn cool things and hang out with cool people and drive cars 200 miles an hour. It's pretty unique, but in the same way, like, you know, my little man throws tantrums and has blowout diapers that I got to change. No different than anybody else. You know, it's like, that's just his life. I just happen to have a cool, pretty cool job. Well, I, I myself, I definitely can't thank you enough for, for choosing that job and for sharing your talents with, with millions of other fans like me who just enjoy sitting down on the couch on a Sunday afternoon and watching a, a good old American sport like NASCAR. So, Corey, I want to ask you about um, – I'm, so I'm, I haven't looked for myself. I don't know if you guys have any more next-gen testing, um, but I would assume that's about wrapped up for the year. Um, so yeah. that being said, you guys have had a few times uh, to be in it and kind of check it out. Um, what do you feel like the learning curve is going to be like? And uh, maybe what kind of what kind of things are you looking um, as far as like setup? Do you guys feel that there's going to be any major challenges? And I guess I asked that because yesterday on NASCAR.com, we seen some footage where teams were really yawing out the right rear of the car and it was kind of crab walking as it went down the straightaway. And like, I understand that it's for the side force on the right rear of the car, but is that is that something? Do you think that'll be a common trend, or does NASCAR say no? We're not going to let you yaw it like that. Um, well, there's no rules or inspection in tech, right? So you yeah. can or, or tech there at the test. So you can go. You can go. So what they were doing? They were doing the opposite of that Daytona. So you skew them to the like left rear to the inside to get the spoiler out of there. Um, so it's the opposite of side force. So you're just trying to take drag out of the car. And being that there's no, no rules of test, you, people were just experimenting with that to see how far was a gain until it wasn't to get the left side of the blade there. You know, but when you go back to the race, whether you go through for practice or qualifying, like it's got to be right. So you won't see cars drastically that far out um, with crab walking because NASCAR, A, they don't like to see cars drive – like that they want cars at least to look straight whether that be the old skew like right rears out for side force uh they they want the cars to look straight like the bodies are now designed straight which i think the cars look killer just the profiles of them and and once the paint schemes start coming out like they'll be they'll be really looking smoking but i think that certainly may learn a curve because the tires are different that's probably the biggest transition for 
for me as a driver as well as trying to figure out figure out the aero balance difference and aero positions you can put yourself in which ones you can which ones you can't um you know so there's lots of stuff to learn in a short period of time but having those couple of tests lets you get kind of situ- situated in the car and gives you an idea what to expect with that sequential shifter and uh some other things so um you know it's it's at the end of the day as though it's a race car there's some things that are different and new and exciting and you figure out after a couple of runs you get used to it and you just got to get to a point where and you'll get to a point you know a couple of races into the year where the the car is back to be an extension of your body, right? Just like the Gen 6 car, you just, it's second nature, what the car does, how it reacts, where the corners of it are. Right now you're still trying to learn your, your literally point of view to your right front corner, to your left rear corner, where your mirrors are, like all those sight lines are different. So once your brain gets acclimated to that, it'll be business as usual. Well, I appreciate that response because that that kind of takes care of the next question that I have. And that was just to, to parallel more with the learning curve of everything that's different with this car versus, you know, the previous models. I was going to ask you, did you expect with the learning curve if that would cause more accidents or or is it just that, like you said, at the end of the day, you guys are professionals and you guys will get it. A couple of races in, we'll get acclimated and it's back to normal, I guess. Um, I mean, the cars are harder to drive, you know. They're, they don't drive great right now because they don't have the downforce. They don't have the side force. Uh, so that just makes for a harder car to handle. And, you know, I spun out once in the test just trying to find that edge and found it. Luckily, we didn't tear up anything. Uh, and, and we saw Tyler Reddick spin out pretty much every time he was on the racetrack. But I think there needs to be an edge that you can go try to find or try to tow and get a time advantage for it. Right before that, uh, with as much downforce and side force as we had with the previous car, you, you were only, you were limited and capped by the potential speed of the car you can hold it wide open. And that was, you had what you had pretty much everywhere. So if we can get to where it's a little bit handling, uh, prevalent more so than what we had puts it back in the driver's hands a little bit and, and rewards being brave, uh, it rewards tighten the belts up and get going a little bit deeper, a little bit wider arc than what the guy, uh, the next guy will do. And, and I think that that's, certainly the direction that they're going. Very cool. Well, uh, this year, Corey, uh, we got, <clears throat> we got the new car, uh, got some new tracks. We got some new drivers. We even got some new teams, um, as a fan and also as a, uh, uh, race car driver, what are you most excited about to see play out? Well, I don't want to burn up all my content for stacking pennies. We're doing that tomorrow for the first episode of the year, but, uh, I just think there's so much, there's so much excitement behind the sport with the LA race, with the 500 sold out a month and a week, you know, five weeks before the season starts, infield and the sta- stands, like that's crazy. I mean, granted, it sold out for the five or the 500 in 2020 when when Trump was there and that Air Force won the whole deal, uh, and that place was rocking. So I can only imagine how that place is going to be come Sunday. It's a special event regardless, but the fact that every butt's going to be in a seat, uh, it, it's going to be electric. And, and the fa- you know, we're going to still be on our conservative speedway program for, you know, fi- 495 miles because the 500 just pays, it pays five, th- or it pays five times more than every other race, right? So for our financial position as we are in a team you know people would we would rather i just say we we would rather ride around for you know 190 laps let and let what happens happens and if there's 30 cars left and you get in there and try to make a couple runs with with you know a couple laps to go and see how high you can get but you know for us to be up there racing trying to get track position throughout the course of the race and, and risk getting our stuff torn up and leaving that much amount of points and, and money on the table. It's hard to swallow, but you know, on the flip side, you're not going to be in, it's rare to be in position to win. If you're not up there fighting all day long, like we were in the Daytona September race, you have to be up there. You have to be pushing the people at the right time. That way you get the push when it matters. So, you know, it, it'll be a long shot for, the, for us to win the 500 with the game plan that, that we go in with, uh, we go in with really our goal is to finish in the top 10. Uh, you know, 
to start the year off strong, not trash a car and put the big checks in the bank because finishing eighth at the 500 last year paid more than probably winning more than three quarters of the races. So, you know, by just that stat alone, like for us with all the cash going out the front door right now, trying to buy all this next gen stuff, like we could use the couple hundred grand to finish in the top 10, right. To keep this thing going, it's going to go regardless, but to really get the thing off in a good spot. So we don't feel like we're, we're tight by the end of the, by the end of the year. So, um, you know, that's our strategy. It'll be, um, you know, conservatively aggressive because I, I don't think you can put your guard down. You got to be on it all day long, but, um, you know, we won't be up there contending and try to lead laps halfway through the race. So, um, but beyond that, you know, going to the call, like I legitimately think I'm going into the LA Coliseum with the mindset of, of being the favorite. I don't see why not. I mean, I think everybody else is too, but you know, I won, I won at Bummer Gray stadium, which is going to be a very similar race track to what uh, that was. And Kyle Larson was on the pole in that race and he finished fourth or fifth. You can watch it on YouTube, Chase Elliott, Daniel Suarez, Bubba Wallace, Brett Moffitt. I mean, all the, all the cats were there, you know, and they were behind the 07. So I can certainly get it done. I think the smaller elbows up finesse racetracks that we go to, and that'll be the, probably the most fun we've been to in 50 years as a sport. So I'm going to love beating and banging out there on that new pavement in the LA Coliseum for sure. So we definitely got a lot of exciting stuff coming up. And speaking of all that excitement, uh, you and your wife, Miss Kelly, you guys are expecting. Uh, when's when's the due date on that, man? Boy, girl? Yeah, so May May 31st. Um, and we found out it was a boy. We haven't really announced it, but I guess now it's public. So you know, we told, you know, we told family and friends. And I don't think we we're going to do a big gender reveal. Not really our style, but um, – yeah, it's going to be another boy. So we're going to have two boys in the LaJoy house, three boys in the LaJoy household, if four if you want to count the dog. But, um, <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of great stuff going on right now. I'm trying to not take it for granted because these these good seasons where everybody's healthy and, you know, things are going good in life don't last forever. Yeah, man. So, how's everything at home? Wife and kids are good, though? Everything's going good? Oh, yeah. I mean, th things are good, you know, just – trying to get ready. I was at the shop today, putting some stuff in the 500 car, trying to get the cockpit dialed in. And, um, you know, just making sure everybody's we're holding all each other accountable, trying to build as much speed as we can out of them Camaros. So there, there are no excuses for the, for us not, um, you know, winning, winning a race is my goal. It's probably not necessarily a team's goal, whether it's certainly not a management goal. Uh, but I would, I think we can legitimately win a race. I, I think I'm that confident. I think Ryan Sparks thinks we're going to race. So uh, that's that's the level of confidence we have going in. And we'll evaluate and hopefully we uh, can hit the ground run. And I think that we haven't been worse than a eighth place car at any of the tests, which, um, you know, when you multiply that out, that, you know, it's about double uh, or about half the amount of cars at the test that, that will be on the main field. So, you know, I thought that we've been a, between sometimes a fifth place car, sometimes a 13th to 18th place car. So I think that if we can race just in that group, then then we're, you know, then we're mean in business. So, Corey, um, uh, last a month, January in Daytona, um, when I watched a next gen test, um, either I'm observant or I'm creepy, but I saw the Spire team eat what looked like Chipotle for lunch. Uh, I, and it made me think what exactly is the diet of a race car driver? I guess the day of a race or the day before, like how, how does that all play out? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I tried it. I've like the last, 16 months I've really cleaned up what I've eaten. Uh, I've been working with a nutritionist and I, there's a machine called in body. You can stand, scan, stand on it. And it'll scan your body mass index and your metabolic rate and body fat percentage and bone death, like all the stuff. Right. So I've been really uh, trying to hone that in because that's something I can control and I do feel better mental clarity and just endurance over the course of the race, over the course of the year when you're eating healthy and, and you're not carrying a lot of excess fat. So uh, I've worked on that, seen some gains there just by cutting really, truly unneeded gluten, 
sugar, particularly. Um, and you, what you notice was a barbacoa bowl with guac, white rice, black beans. So I, I was on a kick. I was eating Chipotle probably three, four times a week. Now I've spread it out a couple of different restaurants around Charlotte, but, um, yeah, I, I think that a lot of people don't take the nutrition side serious and you can work out as much as you want to, but, um, you know, you can't outrun your fork. And if you, you gotta, you gotta make sure that sucker, uh, is putting good stuff to fuel your body. Cause you know, I think the window to be a race car driver is, is larger than a lot of other sports in terms of career lifespan, but it's still in the grand scheme of things, a, a short time. Cause if I can do this, you know, for another 10 years, uh, I think that that would be an unbelievable career. Um, so, but that thing would be, it would be over in a blink. So I'm going to try to make sure to maximize it and not leave any stone unturned when it comes to trying to be a championship or, or a race winning race car driver. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, eat, eating the right stuff, eating big breakfast, not eating the, not eating the junk, trying to cut that stuff out, uh, is certainly a good start to, uh, what I'm trying to do. All right. Well, Corey, uh, I, I have a little bit of a bone to pick with you. So Bring I it. went home and I watched the the replay of the, the YouTube stream of, uh, NASCAR's next gen testing and uh, you said on NASCAR.com that uh, moving the seven or moving the number closer to the front wheel was cooler than the OG uh, position. So uh, since you've already gone to the dark side of uh, that conversation, I wanted to know, um, have you already ordered your uh, little hot pants IndyCar uh, fire suit yet with your uh, tight ankles? Is that, is that coming next or what? I, I thought that's a good question. I thought that, you know, the door, the numbers in the middle of the door was a hill I was willing to die on, but it's not, you know, because I've seen some cool, some cool number forward paint schemes, two of which will be on the seven car this year because the built car and the shooter car are sick. So wait, wait for those things to drop. Uh, I feel like we've probably done. I have now granted I'm biased to obviously my own car, my own partners. Um, but I haven't seen any scheme that's going to look cooler than what the built and the Schluter the schemes look, uh, they, they look so sick and they utilize all the space, uh, that NASCAR was trying to accomplish with moving the number forward. I, however, would probably die in the hill of boot cuffs on my fire suit. If, uh, if you ever see me with the Jimmy Johnson, freaking, you know, Lewis Hamilton leg bottoms, go ahead and just slap me. Cause I, I don't know if I can do it All right. now. Never say never, never say never, but it'll be a long time before that happens. It's that's consent there. I know the law, so, <laughs> you know, All can't right. say never. You can say probably not never, probably not ever, but not never. All right. Well, uh, Corey, wrapping it up, man, uh, we appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, before we wrap it all up, uh, we wanted to know uh, you um, in, I think it was in January, you tweeted that uh, in 2022, we're coming to collect. Um, we wanted to know exactly what you meant by that and also what the goal is of the Spire 7 team in general this year versus last year uh how how is everything looking yeah we haven't uh we haven't actually sat down and had that conversation uh before the season started we, we will of what you know what tangible goals are and what you know the lofty goals are um my goals and sparks's goals will be higher than what the expectations are probably externally as well as internally from steve latar or tj or jeff and you know ownership but you know, if, if the two guys that have probably the most impact be, being Ryan and, and one being me behind the wheel, like if my, if our hopes aren't higher than everybody else's, then what, what the hell are we doing? So, you know, I think with, you know, we're going to be a, a underrated uh, team with low expectations from the outside. And I think that's, what's going to set us up uh, to really hurt some people's feelings over the course of the year. Cause you know, those runs where we had, you know, Daytona in, in the fall when we were, we had the, the reins pulled off and we were up there contending for the lead and leading a couple laps and, and we're running second on the white flag. And then follow that up with Darlington running in the top 10 all night. Like those runs will happen 
instead of once every seven or eight weeks that last year, they'll happen every three weeks. I think this year, uh, not to say we're that a t- top 15 car consistently might be, we'll see how, what speed we fire off with, but there's no reason why we can't be a top 15 car every other week or every three weeks um, and, and really get up there and, and confuse some people as to what the seven car is doing. So <laughs> running so good. I think that's what the potential of this next gen car is. Very cool. Well, I think we can all uh, agree that uh, we can bank on the pennies being cashed this year. Uh, Corey, we appreciate you spending the time to hang out with us, uh, just regular, ordinary fans. And uh, man, we just thank you so much. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all support. Stag and Penny is going to be a good year, fellas. All right, brother. Appreciate you so much, brother. Yeah, man. Appreciate y'all. Keep up the good work. Sir, we'll do what we can. Yeah. Boy, the joy. Thank you so much for uh, spending a little bit of time uh, with Josh and I here and everybody at the shoe show, everybody that tunes in and listens every month on the 7th. Um, couldn't appreciate you more, man, for everything that you're – that you're doing and uh, we want to wish you the best of luck in 2022 man uh hope you're coming to collect for sure um next uh let's talk to uh mr andrew miller team super shoes member of the month andrew what you got for us man hey team super shoe my name is andrew miller and i am a longtime supporter of corey joy and a longtime member of the group team super shoe here on facebook josh and mike asked me to come on and talk a little bit about why I'm such a big fan of Corey's and why I've been a fan of his for so long and also to show you guys a little bit of my collection that I've been fortunate enough to grow over the last few years. Um, For me, in 2013, I was fortunate enough to attend an ARCA race at Pocono that Corey was able to win. Um, For me, I was in between drivers. Um, I was looking for somebody to, to plant my flag with and for me, seeing Corey being my age and beginning to excel in a sport that he's put so much time and effort into, uh, it made it so easy for me to support him. Um, Then over the next few years, I've been able to meet Corey a few times and just follow him and interact with him on social media. And just seeing how down to earth he is, for me, it's just a no brainer. Um, And then being fortunate enough to go through some of the same things as him as far as getting married and having children and then just listening to him put the amount of emphasis on his faith that he does that really hits home for me Um, so I'm going on almost 10 years of supporting Corey and I plan on making it many more Um, but next I'll show you guys a little bit of the collection that I do have so the beginning of my collection here for Corey is diecast. I've always been a long time diecast collector and really enjoyed the hobby. Um, the past couple of years I've really st- stopped collecting other drivers and started working towards a goal of collecting every paint scheme of Corey's, whether it be something that Lionel makes or getting it custom made. Um, my favorite one that I have currently is the Scooby-Doo car. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Corey sign a uh, replica of the Mystery Machine. And after I get these two here signed in the front, I would like to make a display out of them. Uh, just for something cool to look at. Uh, my son really likes Scooby-Doo too, so I think it's pretty cool to have that and be able to share that with him. Um, into the other die cast, um, I have uh, a car there from his K&N series. And then the white 77 is a, from one of his first two cup starts in 2014. Um, it transitions there over into a couple of Xfinity rides that he had um, between 2014 and 2016. And then starting with the white 23, um, we get into his uh, cup career with BK Racing. Um, It slowly um, transitions there over into the 72s, which was from 2018 with TriStar, where he split a ride with Cole Whip. And then into the 32s there, where um, honestly, I feel like Corey gained most of his notoriety in the cup series. Um, It was his first true uh, full-time ride. Uh, He made the team better, had a lot of strong performances. And they had a lot of killer paint schemes too, in my opinion. Um, And then we even get down here into a couple of the uh, Spire Motorsports cars from from this year. Um, Next, we head back here to um, the beginning of my sheet metal collection. 
Um, the orange and white name rail was my first piece of Corey's for my collection. It's from a 2017 Rywish um, BK Racing in the Schluter Systems car. And then also I have one from uh, Go Fast Racing. I was not able to pinpoint a paint scheme, unfortunately, but it's still a pretty sweet piece to have. Um, next is honestly what I consider to be my holy grail for my collection. Um, it is the 2020 Dry Dean Fire Suit from Go Fast Racing. Um, this is from the first race they came back to after the COVID break at Darlington. Um, I cannot put into words how fortunate I feel to be able to own something like this. So um, my goal is to one day get it put in the shadow box and have it properly displayed. Um, next, um, we head over here into some more of my sheet metal. Um, the 32 side is uh, the Schluter Systems from Bristol in 2020. Um, I was able to attend this race, so whenever I attend a race, I try to track down metal from Corey's card for my collection, if possible. Uh, so this is honestly my biggest piece, and I'm very, very happy to have it. Um, the next piece we have here is um, the Keen Parts face mask car from Martinsville in 2020. Um, also in the back there, there's um, a quarter panel off of the original face car uh, run by, I believe this one was at Atlanta. It wasn't the Daytona 500 car, but just to have those two pieces, I feel like they go very well together. Um, my goal is to get them up on the wall and have them kind of go together as a whole piece. Uh, next is the Dry Dean piece from, this is from 2020, uh, the fall at Dover. The Dry Dean did a fan boat between three paint schemes to see which one they were going to run for the for the double header that weekend um, and this is the scheme that won the next piece is the um, the door it's off the other side from the piece that Joey showed in the last episode um, from the Bristol dirt race for me I wanted to own a piece off of the car just because of the historic value to it being the first cup race on dirt in 50 years and then just the fact that it's Corey I mean it made it so much easier to make the decision on it but um, honestly that's probably one of my favorite pieces the orange on it is just incredible the um the next piece here is the arc.io car from martinsville in the spring of 21 this is unfortunately the race that we got wrecked on pit road but i was in attendance for this one um and i think the scheme is absolutely beautiful so just to be able to have that and then also the uh tire there to go with it i think it's pretty cool to have the set um, I was able to confirm that that is from the same Martinsville race. And then the uh, last piece here that I have is the Raging Bull car from the Daytona 500 wreck. Um, wasn't really sure about owning something like this, but I figured for just the historical value on it, um, for the time being, it's something I'm going to have and hold on to. Um, then the last few things that I do have are a couple of crew shirts here from various paint schemes that he's run over the years. And then also the very last thing I would like to show you guys is uh, a pair a pair of gloves um, that I was fortunate enough to win from the NASCAR Foundation. Uh, for me, any time that I can support Corey and support charity, uh, it's a no-brainer and uh, I have no problem doing it. But I, uh, I greatly appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, watch and view my collection. Um, thank you for supporting Corey and supporting Team Super Shoe. And I hope you guys have a great day. Appreciate you, Andrew, so much, man. That is a really awesome collection. We appreciate you showing all the goodies that you got back there. And if you ever got some diecast cars you need to get rid of, I'm sure me and Josh can find a little bit extra room, take care of that for you. But uh, man, thank you so much for all your support of both Team Super Shoe and the shoe show and most importantly thanks for for supporting Corey the joy uh none of this is possible and and none of this even has a premise if it wasn't for that guy um that's who we pull for and that's who we like and it's just uh it's really incredible actually just to be able to have this opportunity to be able to provide some kind of original content um for Corey the joy thanks thanks so much to you shoe and everybody behind the scenes at spire motorsports who helps uh helps get us to where we're at for sure i want to piggyback on that um wanted to kind of express my gratitude like you said to the uh people who have helped us get here um you know i i was just invited to be uh an admin on team super shoe on facebook 
uh, last year because um, I kind of makeshifted a seven sticker onto my truck and Corey LaJoy shared it and it blew up, brought a bunch of people in and they said, hey, uh, we need some help. Uh, some of the admins that were on there and um, because of that day and I just thought it'd be cool to help out. Um, I have grown so many uh, friends and, uh, you know, friendships like you and I, Mike, and uh, uh, it, it's just kind of cool to now look back and see how everything has worked out. Now we are, we're even bringing original content on YouTube and uh, it's just uh, pretty cool. Um, I just wanted to personally say thank you uh, again to Corey and thank you uh, to everybody behind the scenes who has given me this opportunity to have these interviews. Um, so, and I'm sure all the rest of the fans on uh, Team Super Shoe uh, agree. Uh, it's cool to have this uh, fan interaction and uh, not, it's nothing, you know, nothing business, nothing professional. It's just two fans wanting to talk to, uh, talk to some race car drivers or talk to our crew chiefs. So uh, with that being said, we appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Uh, this is going to wrap up probably the best episode of the year. Hopefully we get some better stuff, but I mean, you can't beat Corey LaJoy. So uh, until next, uh, next month, what it will be uh, March 7th. So I'm sure we'll have plenty of races to talk about then. I'm excited that we're finally racing. So until then, uh, you guys, God bless, and thank you for watching.